grace. God's grace. The national anthem for most of Christendom calls it amazing. And one of the lines in the song says, it saved a wretch like me. Well, beyond the existential experience of God's grace, I think the most amazing thing about it is that it exists at all. Think about it. An almighty, omnipotent God stretching his mighty arm from eternity into time for the sole purpose of initiating a plan, a plan to restore relationships with a people that rebelled, resisted. They were even at times revolting and repulsive. How do we explain the existence of God's grace? Well, the only way we can is because grace is an action verb that emanates from his love. It's only God's love that can ye be used to rationalize or understand his grace. You remember the old hymn? Grace, grace, marvelous grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace that is greater than all my sin. That grace evolves for many of us into a confident assurance, a glorious hope that when I draw a fleeting breath, when I close mine eyes in death, I will rise to worlds unknown and I'll see him on his throne. That's grace and oh, how amazing. Thank you, Father. So how many this morning will agree that our God is a great God and His grace is in every way absolutely and completely amazing. God's amazing grace. This morning we're celebrating God's grace. And to do that, first of all, I want to think about what we're talking about. What is it that we mean when we say God's grace is amazing? What, what, what does that mean? What, how do we describe the grace of God? How would we define the grace of God? And, and you've heard some of those, no doubt, through the years. One, one of my favorites, I mean, early on, it was a kind of an acrostic, you know, grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. One of my favorites, I've used it for, well, ever since I first heard it, God's riches at Christ's expense. And then here's another one that I hear routinely reiterated uh, in description of the grace of God. Well, it's, it's God's unmerited favor. I like that's true. It's right. It's, it is unmerited favor. But the word itself, what does that word grace mean? Well, simply put, the grace of God is the gift of God. I mean, that's the word. That's what we mean when we talk about God's grace being amazing. Well, God's gift to us, God's gift is an amazing gift. But by gift, what do we mean? What does that mean? Well, you understand that if I, if I earn something, whatever I receive because of the work that I've done is not a gift. You, you might call it a wage. You might call it a token of appreciation, some kind of recognition for what I've done, but if I've done something to earn it, well, then it's not a gift, right? Instead, the gift has to be, that which is truly a gift, is that which is initiated, listen carefully, by the giver, that which is given spontaneously with no pressure from the outside, no have to, must, but that which the giver chooses to give freely with, with no uh, sense of pressure, no sense of coercion, 
Uh, it, it's not under compulsion. You, you understand, it, it, it has to begin with the giver himself. A- and he's got to be free and choose to freely give or it's not a gift, right? And it's given then with no strings attached. Does that make sense? I mean, if you, quote unquote, give something to someone with strings attached, well, you can call it an investment, maybe. You're, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going, to, I'm going to invest this in you. I'm going to trust you with this, looking for a return. But that which is gift means no strings attached. It's, it's, it's given spontaneously. It's given freely not under compulsion, not under coercion. It's not the would-be receiver putting pressure on me to get, if if I'm responding to the pressure of the one that would be the receiver, then it can't be a gift. It's got to be freely given, no strings attached. Does that make sense? Now watch this. Our God has given us a great gift. That which he initiated, not under compulsion. You understand? He There was no outside pressure. God did not have to do what he did. He freely chose to give us that which is this amazing gift. And it's so amazing. Paul says it's indescribable. It's unspeakable. It's too big for words. But but if I were to give one word to describe the gift of God, the grace of God, that one word would be the person of Jesus Jesus is God's gift. Did did you hear what I just said? He is the gift of God that is unspeakable. He's the gift of God that is indescribable. This gift of God is so amazing that it goes beyond our comprehension. We can't begin to really fully appreciate it. But I I want us to think about it this morning. The, The gift that is Jesus. I want you to see it. Our favorite verse Uh, Probably the most well-known and most beloved verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16, the words of Christ himself. And Jesus said, for God so loved. Notice, it's not just for God loved, but God so loved. And with the word so, we're anticipating, okay, he's now going to tell us what this so loved is about and how it was uh, uh, made known, how it was uh, uh, communicated. For God so loved, what? That he gave. His only begotten Son, that which is the most beautiful, the most wonderful in all of that is the the Son of God, the, the second person of the triune Godhead. God gave His Son. For God so loved that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever, and I believe the word whosoever means exactly that, that whosoever, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from, what you've done, what you're doing. I don't, I don't care where you are. That whosoever believes in him, trusts him, depends upon him, put, puts his confidence in him, embraces the reality of what he did, believing it to be true. Whoever, whosoever trusts him, believes him, should not perish. I love that word, by the way, perish. Yeah, it's the same word that's translated to be lost. So he says that whosoever believes in him should not be lost. Implication, instead would be found. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not be lost, but that he might receive, listen careful, everlasting life. And ultimately we're talking about eternal life, that kind of life, listen, that God is. That kind of life that is from everlasting to everlasting without beginning of days, without end of days. That kind of life that is not just quantity, but quality. A life worth living. A life of fullness and significance and meaning. A life that is worth living for time and for all of eternity. The kind of life that God is. This is his gift to us. That we'd be found no longer lost and made alive with the life of God. Incredible. How many of you understand that to have Jesus is to have everything? And I really want you to hear that. The Bible teaches in Christ Jesus we have been made complete, lacking nothing. And I, I really believe when the Bible says we've been made complete, that's exactly what it means. Sometimes the Bible doesn't say what it means. Sometimes it doesn't mean what it says, but it always means what it means. Well, listen, I believe what he means there, he says, and what he says there, he means that in Christ we are absolutely and perfectly complete, lacking nothing. We have everything. 
everything that is to be had of God. He hasn't held anything back. I mean, Paul makes that argument, right? Remember? There in Romans chapter 8, he says, if God would not spare his own son, but gave him willingly, is there anything that he would withhold? Is there anything that God would say, well, I'm not going to give you that. (laughs) No, he gave us the ultimate in giving his son. In Christ Jesus, we have received that which is the fullness of God. We've received all there is of God. He, Jesus, is the everything of God so that we have become partakers. We have become recipients of that which, well, the Bible says it like this. The Bible says that that God has given to us all that pertains to life and godliness. That is everything you need to live life on planet Earth. All the challenges, all the hardships, difficulties, frustrations. In Christ, it's been given to you. See, He is the all of God. Is anybody hearing this? this? We're talking about the amazing grace of God. Yeah. He, we, we, we have been given, we have received all that pertains to, and all that pertains to godliness. That is, God-likeness. What you need in order to be and do what God called you to be in a godly kind of life. God has given you in the person of Jesus. And what that means is, you are completely supplied because of Him. That's God's amazing grace. You lack nothing. Well, I can't cover everything, but I I want to make sure I include everything that I included in my list, okay? Think about the grace of God and how amazing it is. The Bible teaches in Christ Jesus that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. In Christ, the Bible teaches that we've been made the righteousness of God, which means we are as right with God as God is right with himself And with that, listen, guys, you cannot become more right with God. Not now, not ever. You you have been made the righteousness of God. That's who you are now. This is God's grace, his gift to you. you. You didn't earn it. This wasn't something you pressured God into or worked out of him. No, he initiated. He spontaneously, an expression of his heart of love, he chose to give you that, which is his incredible gift of righteousness. Oh my goodness, made the righteousness of God as right with God. I'm as right with God as God is right with God. That's who you, that's the grace of God, the amazing gift of God. You've been made holy and blameless, Ephesians chapter 1. And the Bible teaches this is God's gift to you that you are now justified for time and for all of eternity. Justified. You've heard it right? Just as if you never sinned. Just as if you never did anything but live a perfectly righteous life. You've been made right with God and you are counted without guilt before the throne of God. Justified. God says, so justified that I will remember your sin no more. Now, you'll remember my sin, won't you? But not God. He won't remember my sin. And guys, that doesn't mean that that God has developed amnesia somewhere along the way so that he's forgotten sin. No, in full knowledge of your sin, he has declared, I will never hold it against you. I will never remember it against you. You will never be required to pay the penalty for sin. Why? Because I dealt with that at the cross. You have been justified. I remember your sin no more. Guys, I never get tired of hearing that. And I never get tired of proclaiming that God's grace. I'm so thankful he remembers my sin. We're always, always reminding God of our sin. And I can just hear God say, wait a minute, I don't remember that. What are you talking about? Oh, get away. From, don't break. You want to talk about what we're going to do now, where we're going to go from here, okay? But that has been done, and it's done forever by one sacrifice. Jesus died and paid for sin once and for all the Bible teaches. I'm going to give you one word to finalize it, put it all together. The Bible teaches that you, this is God's gift to you, you right now are absolutely and completely perfect. Perfect. By one offering, Hebrews chapter 10, God has made perfect forever those who are part of the kingdom, those who are part of the the church. God has made you perfect. Did you hear that? You may tell you what that means. You are heaven ready right now. Nothing else needs to happen in order for you to get 
heaven ready. Now, a lot of people think that, well, no, no, there's a lot of things that need to happen. <laughs> they're just sweating that they don't go today. Or, you know, they're not, you know, they're not thinking they're ready. And they, they've got, and, and there's some who've built theologies about purgatory and how they're going to burn it out for a few years. But no, no, I want you to hear this. This is God's gift to you. You're righteous, holy, blameless, justified, perfect, heaven ready right now. Anybody excited about that? That is the grace of God. His amazing grace. Now, this is what happened. The day you got saved, you were joined to Christ. By the grace of God through faith, you were joined to him so that the Bible tells us that you became a living union with Christ, made one with him in spirit. So much so that the Bible teaches that as Christ is right now, so are you in him. See, everything he is, the almighty God, the once crucified but now resurrected and living Lord of all the earth, the one who has all authority, everything he is, all that he is, he is in you. And everything you are, you are in him. And in him, because of his resume, righteous, holy, justified, blameless. God's gift. It's amazing. It's even more amazing when you stop and think about who you were before the grace of God. And don't misunderstand. This is in order to communicate it. You can't really get before the grace of God. But anyway, because the Bible teaches the grace of God before the foundations of the world. Okay, so it's never been, it wasn't like God done one day. You know, I think I'm going to be a God of grace. No, it's who he is. He's always been from everlasting to everlasting is a God of grace, okay? But just for sake of argument, before grace, what did you look like? Well, the Bible teaches that when you showed up on planet Earth, you showed up in Adam's race. Now, listen carefully because it's so important. And sorry for all you guys on my left side, but you're the lost people of the world. <laughs> you are those who are in Adam's race. This is just illustration, Okay. And all you guys, you guys are, you're, you're the found, right? You have believed in the Lord Jesus, been born of his spirit. Okay. You showed up in Adam, and in Adam, the Bible teaches that you were dead to God. By one man's disobedience, Adam, death, sin into the world, and death by sin, for all have sinned in Adam. That's you. Talk to God about it if you don't like it. That's what the Bible teaches. Because of Adam, that moment... When he made his decision to divorce himself from God, he drugged the entire human race with him. And when you showed up on planet Earth, you were in Adam. And you could say, it'd be fair to say, that Adam was in you. Because the Bible teaches that you were by nature a child of wrath, at enmity with God. Dead to God, without God in this world. Lost. I love that word that God uses to describe those who are without him. He describes them as lost. Go through the Bible and you'll notice that Jesus doesn't refer to the lost as sinners unless he's talking in repetition, talking about somebody else and what they've said. But he refers to those who are without God as lost. And with that, he gives them value, you understand. You hear what I'm saying? Have you ever lost something that was precious to you? I mean, maybe a wedding ring or the setting out of the ring. And because it's precious, it's lost to you and it's Well, well, you'll turn the house inside out and upside down trying to find that which is lost to you. But but you won't do that looking for some lint that's missing out of your pocket, right? You had lint in there early when you saw it. It's gone now. I don't know. You might say it's misplaced. Well, we're not going to spend time looking for it. Why? It's not lost to me. But that ring is lost, and I'm going to find it. Please hear this. Dead to God at enmity with God does not mean that God did not love you. It it does not mean that God refused to look upon you. Let me tell you how much God loved you. He gave, listen, he who is eternal, unbegun, unending spirit, invisible spirit, took upon himself our humanity so that he could walk among those who are lost. And, And please hear me. He would go and sit down with them and you're expecting him to have a Bible study. All these lost people just have a Bible study. He just loved them. Wow. That's it. And they were wowed by that. They invited him to their parties. Dear goodness. Oh my. This is God. 
in the flesh, loving those that were lost. He called them lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. I'm looking for you, buddy. I will not stop until I get you. You hear the love of God? Because what happened? God, in his grace, gave to Adam's race the law. Did you know that? Listen. The law was never given to the righteous. Please hear that, church. Never given to the righteous. But but given to the unrighteous. And the Bible teaches that it was given to the unrighteous supremely to demonstrate the need of the unrighteous to receive God's gift of Jesus. Right? Right? You build a building, it's all crooked, but you don't know it because you've got nothing to compare it to. Looks all right. <laughs> look back, it looks good. And then some knucklehead comes along with a plumb line and hangs it beside your building, and you recognize immediately how bad off it is. This thing is all twisted, and it's way out of shape, and it's leaning toward Noah's house, and what are we going to do about it? But here's the point. The plumb line has done its job the moment it points out the fact that the building's off. That's the law. God gave the law to demonstrate to man your way off. And I love you too much to leave you in your blindness in your ignorance I'm coming to declare reality this is truth now with that you understand the plumb line can't help anymore can't fix the problem only point it out that's the law the law cannot help you it never could it's only given by the grace of God to demonstrate man's need for salvation in fact Paul describes it as a pedagogos And in some translations, that's translated as tutor or teacher. But really, a pedagogos was a servant of the master that was given the assignment to watch over the kids, to make sure that they, you know, had their lunches and they went where they were supposed to go and they did what they're supposed to do, go to school, get an education. But then finally, the kid is going to come of age. He's going to become a man. He's going to be full grown and he doesn't need a pedagogos anymore, okay? Paul says that's a good illustration for the law. It was given for man in his immaturity in terms of his understanding, in his his vulnerability. It was given to direct man and to make sure that he saw the way things were so that one day he would come to a place where he would recognize his need for Jesus. That's the law. Now, when the law points a man to his need for Jesus. It's done its job. Can't help you any further. Everybody understand that? It was never given to the church. It was given to Adam's race. You, you've got to hear that. Okay, this is what happened. The day you trusted Christ, you came to the place you recognized, you trusted Christ, and at that moment you were taken out of Adam, no longer in Adam, but in Jesus. And to be taken out of Adam that you might be in Jesus, what that means is the word that God uses to describe it is that you died to Adam. You you no longer live out of Adam. You're no longer connected to Adam. You're no longer part of that realm. You died to Adam and you died to everything that is Adam. You, You died to death, capital D, never to die again. Did anybody hear that? You died to sin. It has no authority over you, the Bible says. You died to your father, the devil. Did you know the devil has no authority over the church? I wish a lot of Christians would believe that. We got people running scared of the devil. and say, come on. The only reason the devil's still around is for you to kick his tail from time to time, just to make sure he understands who you are. You died to sin. And listen carefully. You died to the law. That's not my opinion. It's right here in the text. I want you to see it. It says, therefore, my brethren, you also were made, what? To die to the law. Capital L, make sure you didn't miss it. You were made to die to the law. Wait a minute. Did you die to sin? Yep. Do you live under the authority of sin now? Nope. Did you die to Satan? Yes. Did you die to death? Or will you die one of these days? No. What? Did you, 
Listen, you, if you died to sin and Satan, if you died to death, you died to the law. And I want you to hear this. You were made to die to the law. That is, you don't have an option in this deal. It's not your choice. Now, you may choose to believe that didn't happen. Okay. And you will continue to live as if you are under the law, but you are not. Period. End of discussion. Now, I'm telling you, that is radical in the church today to hear that. It's radical. Right there in the text. You were made to die to the law, which means it has no authority. You don't answer to the law. You're not under the law. You're not supervised by the law. And he goes on to tell you why. He says, you were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another. To who? The one who was raised from the dead. Who are we talking about? The person of Jesus. Why? So that joined to him, made one with him, you might, what? Bear fruit for God. Now, what's the implication of that? Implication? You can't bear fruit for God unless you join to Christ. And joined to Christ means you're not joined to the law anymore. You died to the law. Everybody got that? Now, here's what happens, and it happens all the time. It happens to all of us. You read about it in Romans chapter 7. We, we get this idea, and it's because of people who misunderstand, and it, it's, it's, it's because folks don't rightly divide the word of truth. I was a part of that. I'm still, I mean, I'm still working to know exactly in everything that God says. Please hear me, but this is very clear. Rightly dividing the word of truth begins with understanding that there's a huge, huge chasm of a difference between old covenant and new covenant. And when I see that, changes everything. Old covenant, law. Law, listen. The law is God requiring you to do something. There's some things, to, things that must be done. There's some doing for you. Right? Did you hear that? I don't, I don't make the next statement unless you hear that. The law means that God is requiring you to do something. There's some doing that has to take place. To die to the law means God is no longer requiring you to do. (gasps) Suck all the oxygen out of the room. Wow. Does anybody understand what I just said? See, Under the law, what we're hearing and what we're understanding is that I must do in order to be pleasing to God, win his acceptance, win his favor, get his blessing. I I must do in order to put a smile on God's face. Listen, that's law. You have died to the law. You've been placed in Christ. And in Christ, you are blessed. You have God's favor. And he smiles at you. And he welcomes you and he loves you. You're standing before him not in your resume, but in the resume of the Lord Jesus. And he is your righteousness. And you're perfectly righteous. So the requirement for you to do is done. You died to the law. Now watch this. The Bible says that the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is what? The law. I hear people all the time say, preacher, you need to preach more law. But this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches you preach law. The result is that sin will increase. Did you know that? And I use the illustration all the time. You know, when, when you add law, sin increases. Walking down the sidewalk, board fence with a knot hole in it. I don't even see the knot hole. I walk by that knot hole every day on the way to work, on the way back home after work. And then one day, somebody puts a sign up there and says, do not look through this knot hole. It's a neon sign. It's shining. It's bright. And I I notice it. Not, do not look through that knot hole. Well, what happens? All of a sudden, and this is how Paul says it, sin, taking the opportunity provided by the law, arouses fleshly desire. It's just bringing out what's in there, your flesh. 
And all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself walking slower, trying to get a peek through that hole. And before it's over with, you'll be, if you have to get a stool to get up on it to look through the hole. Am I right? You know I'm right. But now wait. Watch this. Watch this. Now listen. What if somebody adds to that and says, do not peek through this hole under penalty of death? Now, I don't know about some of you, but if I believe the one who wrote that penalty, that law, I'm thinking, I ain't looking through that hole. There ain't nobody on this earth can make me look through that. I'm not, no way, no how, but I sure would like to. <laughs> what do they have over there? They want me to see so bad that they're going to kill me if I look. Anybody hear what I just said? The Bible says for you not to look. That's not the issue. It's to not even want to look. That's the problem. <coughs> Jesus said, you've heard in times past, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's looking through the knot hole. But I say to you that if you have, what? Lusted after a woman, wanted to look, you are an adulterer. Everybody understand that? What does the law do? <laughs> it is a ministry of condemnation and death. That's all it does. It's all it will ever do. Anybody with me? So what I need? Well, listen. The Bible says that the power of sin is the law. Then the Bible says, in case we missed it, in Romans chapter 7, and apart from the law, sin is dead. You understand it in the illustration? Not whole, no law, don't see it. Has no, no effect on me at all. Walk by it every day. <laughs> I don't even pay attention to it. I'm just going to work. Sin is dead. You got any questions about that? Let's talk about it. You hear that. So what's going to keep people from running amok? We've got to have some controls around here, you know. If we tell people that they're no longer under the law, there is no telling what they'll do. I've prayed that prayer. I've cried those tears. Dear God, oh, I don't know if I want to tell these people this. Ain't no telling what they'll do. He said, buddy, if you knew what they were doing already, it'd surprise you. So don't you? <laughs> but again, see, listen, I've told people, you give me the law and enough authority to back it up, and I can control the behavior of your kids. Not whole, sign, don't look, under penalty of death. I can, I can change your behavior. But what the law could not do, what could it not do? It couldn't change a man on the inside. Couldn't fix him. And so God said, let me tell you my answer to you. Adam's race. If you'll trust me, if you'll believe me, I'm going to take you to death. I'm not going to repair you. I'm not going to fix you. I'm going to replace you with a brand new you. And the new you will be Christ, my son, in you, your life. Okay. So I asked you earlier, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Have you, have you been born again? Well, maybe I didn't ask that. I meant to ask that. But anyway, have you been born again? That means you have the life of Christ in you. Now watch this. We have been released from the law having died to that by which we were bound so that we would serve in newness of the Spirit. Not according to the law, but in the newness of the Spirit. What's the Spirit? Who is the Spirit? The person of Christ. Where is He living in us? Actually living in us so that if Christ Himself, Himself is not living in us, we have no gospel. We have nothing to say. We just got another religion. Did you hear what I just said? The gospel is 110% supernatural. Christ himself living in you. Let, let, let me ask you something. I moved in with a woman. Well, I married her first, but I moved in with a woman 40-something uh, years ago. And I want you to know that her around me day after day, week after week, she has some kind of impact on me. Right? Are you telling me that the Son of the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, can move in to you, not just to be with you, but to be in you and not have any kind of influence on you? Did you hear what I just said? You're not left there on your own to do just whatever. The Son of the living God 
who was tempted in every way just like you and I, but was victorious in saying no to every temptation and went to the cross as if guilty and conquered sin and death. He who was raised to live forever lives in you. What do you need with some rules? I mean that. And I mean that seriously. I'm convinced that reason that the church is so weak today is because we've been taught to measure ourselves against our doing law. And the result is a sense of defeat, failure. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, and taught to continue to measure ourselves. You know, how am I doing? Have I read the Bible enough? Have I prayed enough? Have I been sincere enough? Have I, have, I, have I believed enough? It's all this doing, 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 and measuring myself and constantly looking. I'm always looking at me and comparing myself against the law. Instead of looking to the person of Jesus who lives in me and letting him direct my steps. See, wh- where am I going to go for leadership? <clears throat> I can just hear him go, <clears throat> hey, I'm here. I'm in you. I really am. I want you to see this. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Don't don't worry about what are people going to do if you take them out from under the law. The Bible says God can handle His church. See, right there it says, walk in the Spirit. That is, are you alive with the Spirit of Christ? Well, then if you are, then walk in Him. Let Him direct you. And letting Him direct you, the result is that you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And what is the result? Well, the fruit of the Spirit, this is what He produces. It's not what you produce for God. This is God's gift to you. The person of Jesus, all that He is. What does that mean? He brings to you and He gives you love. It's yours. You're not waiting to get it. You got it. But you're looking at the law for instruction when God says, the one who is love is living in you. Let me be who I am and direct your steps. You see the difference. Choose. I'm not living in response to an outer demand. I'm living in response to the person of Christ living in me. That's miraculous. That's supernatural. That's incredible. That's amazing. God's amazing grace. If we live in the Spirit, alive with Christ, so let us walk in the Spirit. Knowing that it is God working in you, both willing to do that, which is pleasing to you. See, what the law couldn't do was change a man's heart. God said, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out your heart and replace it with a brand new heart. And I'm going to put my spirit inside of you. And I'm give you a brand new spirit. And I'm going to begin to work in you, causing you to walk into my ways. And this is what it's going to look like. I am going to lead you into a whole new way of thinking. So that your desires change. And what was a law and a rule and something that you resisted now becomes something that you delight in. (laughs) And you say, how did that happen? Christ himself living in you, that's how it happened. What, What are we saying? God's grace is amazing. I have been made alive by the grace of God. And it's by the grace of God I live. It's by the grace of God I grow. It's by the grace of God that I do. It's all gift. And it's never initiated by me. It's always initiated by him. And that was always the plan. When God created man, perfect garden, everything's set, you got it all. No Ten Commandments. Instead, God said, you can do anything, eat anything, But there's one thing right there. You've got to make a decision. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Are you going to trust me with what I just told you? Or are you going to come up with your own plan? Man came up with his own plan, which is a self-help plan. A do-it-yourself plan. He denied the reality of God. And we've been taught that ever since. You can't bank on God to do what he said he would do. He said he would take away our sin remember it no more. Did he do that? Yeah, he did. If you don't believe it, he still did it. Did he give you life? Yes, he did. And maybe you don't believe it. Well, then you'll act like you, he never received him, but you, he lives in you. That is the way it is. You have the peace of God. My peace I give you, said Jesus. 
You're not waiting to get it. You're not striving to be a person of peace. You are. Now, believing it changes the way you respond to the world around you. With Christ, He gave us all. You still want to please God, don't you? I know. Okay. Maybe one more thing and I'm done. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. What does that mean? God says, stop trying to do to please me and trust me. That pleases me. Because you're buying into the fact that I'm God, not you. Do you see that? I want that for you, says God. I want you to rest in me. Well, I just want to know to do, how do I do the works of God? <laughs> Jesus corrected the grammar and turned works, plural, to work, singular, and said, this is the work of God that you believe the one that he sent. That's pleasing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Wow! Well, let's pray. Father, grace, amazing, that word's not enough. I, I need another word. Amazing, yes, it's amazing. It's indescribable, it's unspeakable, it's glorious, it's magnificent, it's beyond words. Even as Paul said, it's indescribable. But such is your incredible grace. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you to think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, I believe. He said, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was talking about that teaching that is that, that teaching that says you can find life by keeping the law. Jesus said it's like leaven. It, it operates kind of behind the scenes quietly. And you don't even see it's working until when you do, and then it's too late. And, and what you have when you add the teaching of the Pharisees, which is law and legalism, you add that which is legalism, that which is that of the Judaizers, you add the law to what I'm teaching, that leaven, and you will get what I am not, te- what I am not teaching. And here's my point. I'm concerned that for years the church has not been careful to watch and beware of the leaven added to the gospel of grace. And at Colonial Hills, my prayer is that we will watch and beware of the leaven. It's core value. It's what speaks to us. God's goodness and grace. In His name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand.